Hi, in this video, I'm going to continue on the topic chemical reactions and energy. And from our previous video, I have discussed it, the calorimetric experiments of determining the enthalpy change of neutralization. And for today's video, we are going to further discuss two very classic experiments. And here we are going to start by looking at the enthalpy change of reaction between zinc powder and dilute hydrochloric acid. Well, actually it could be um, other metals reacting with other acid. And this actually is an example of a redox reaction. And for most of the redox reaction, it is exothermic. So actually the experimental design is very similar to our previous uh, experiment pertaining neutralization. Again, we try to mix the two reagents, allow them to react, and we were looking at the temperature change of the final solution. And from there, we are going to calculate the heat released it, and at the end, we are going to calculate the enthalpy change of reaction. Now, the experimental setup should not be too complicated. We have a polystyrene cup, and inside, we have 100 cm cube of 1m hydrochloric acid, so basically, we uh, weigh 2 grams of zinc powder, we add it into the cup, stir it a few times, cover it with a lid, and insert the thermometer and monitor the temperature change uh, for a couple of minutes. And we try to register the maximum temperature reached, and from there, we can determine the uh, temperature change and proceed to the calculation. So if you look at this uh, scenario, before we start the reaction, the temperature of the solution is 25.6 and the highest temperature attained it is 29.4. Okay? Now, first of all, before we actually calculate the uh, heat change, we actually need to determine the limiting reagent. Because, again, this is a reaction and this time it is not just 1 to 1 mole ratio. In this case, we have 1 to 2 mole ratio. Uh, that's why it would be best to start off with writing down a balanced chemical equation. And from there, using all the given information, we try to calculate the number of moles of the two reagents. And it turns out that uh, zinc is the limiting reagent. So here, we will use the limiting reagent to perform our calculation of enthalpy change. All right. Now, these are the usual practice. Um, here we go to MC delta T, we sub in all those uh, numbers. Now here, 100 gram is with reference to the 100 cm cube here. Again, we will assume the final solution is pure water. So we have 100 gram of pure water at the end. Um, some of you may think, hey, should I put down 102 grams? Uh, no, because again, we are assuming that we are all the solutions that we have after the reaction is just pure water. So uh, 100 gram because it's a 100 cm cube. Okay? Uh, the specific heat capacity would be using the one for pure water. The temperature change would be this one. And you get this heat change. This is the heat released from the reaction. And then now you're going to calculate the delta HQ over N. Uh, here is an exothermic reaction, so therefore it is negative, and it divide it is divided by the number of moles of zinc because it is the limiting reagent. So this is the answer, okay? Negative fifty one point nine kilojoule per mole. All right. So um, the calculation part should not be difficult, should not be too new to you. But from this example, I would like to introduce a very important technique, which is called extrapolation. So um, the idea is like this. Uh, you think about this reaction. So this reaction, when as it proceeds, it takes some time, right? The reaction doesn't complete immediately. Now it is different from our previous example where we talk about neutralization. For neutralization reaction, it is between two aqueous solution, two aqueous acid and alkali. The reaction takes place almost instantaneously. So basically the reaction has completed the moment when the two solutions are mixed in. Okay? However, in this particular experiment, it is between a solid zinc powder and hydrochloric acid. 
So actually the reaction takes some time to be able to complete. All right, let's just say it takes one minute to complete. Now think about it, within this one minute of time, heat is continuously lost to the surrounding, right? So therefore, during that one minute time, the heat is lost, which will lead to an underestimated result of the maximum temperature, right? So maybe, theoretically, it can reach like 30 degrees Celsius, but because within that one minute uh, reaction time, heat is lost to the surrounding. So it turns out that it is only like 29.4 degrees Celsius. So the underestimated maximum temperature, how can we rectify it? How can we correct it? Uh, we can do so by using the technique called extrapolation. Okay, now if you look at this one, so what we are trying to do here is to register the temperature before and after the reaction. Now you see here, uh, the reaction starts at this particular time and the temperature of the mixture slowly increase and at this particular time the curve reaches maximum and afterwards the temperature decreases. Now first of all, why the temperature decreases as the reaction has completed? That makes sense because as the temperature has completed, no more heat is released so the hot reaction mixture start to lose heat to the surrounding and therefore the temperature of the mixture decreases after the reaction. Now, but what is the point of taking so many data points even the reaction has completed? The reason is because by taking these data points, we are able to establish a curve where it indicates the heat loss to the surrounding. So from here, we are able to trace back by extrapolating this curve backwards. Extrapolating means make the curve longer and we extrapolate it backward. So we try to extrapolate it back to the time where the reaction start. So as you elongate this curve and you also kind of draw a reference line over here and at this particular point we have an intersection. Actually if you look at the original curve it gives you 37.6 degrees Celsius. This is what we observed from the experiment. But like I said, this one is inaccurate because of the heat loss. If you do this extrapolation, we are able to trace back and we are able to determine the maximum temperature, assuming that there is no heat loss at all, plus the reaction complete instantaneously. So therefore, here uh, you see the maximum temperature is 41.2. So this is the theoretical maximum temperature and if we are able to do this extrapolation technique we are able to work out the more um, rectified it, more corrected maximum temperature and therefore able to correct our uh, experimental results and make it more reliable okay so this is the idea um, but here even though you do this now again uh, the technique here is to Assume that the reaction complete instantaneously with no heat loss, right? But this assumption also have an assumption behind, which is we assume that the rate of heat loss after the reaction is the same as the rate of heat loss during the reaction. But it, is it exactly the same? Of course not, because during the reaction, the temperature gradually increase. The great, the hotter the mixture is, the faster the heat is lost, right? So here we have drew a straight line showing the rate of heat loss, but in reality, it should not be a straight line. It should be a curve, right? Um, so actually behind this assumption, we still have an assumption, but um, that's the best we can do. And that is surely make our result more accurate and reliable. So this technique is very important, okay? Um, if you go back to the, to the test here, so extrapolation is a technique using in estimating um, part of the curve is extended so that we can trace back the value that is not covered in the curve. Uh, in this experiment, so it takes time for same powder to react completely, heat loss to the heat loss to the surrounding during this process, so the maximum temperature is underestimated. By extrapolating the curve backwards, we are able to 
uh, trace back the heat loss during the reaction and able to rectify our results. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, um, let's have a look at the practice question. Again, you know the drill. Uh, pause the video, try it yourself, and then check the answers. All right, so let's have a look. Um, sing reacts with copper to sulfate. So this one is a displacement reaction because zinc metal is more reactive than copper metal. Now here we have this quantity of zinc added into 300 cm cube, one mole per dm cube copper to sulfate solution. Polystyrene cup with the lid. The temperature was monitored throughout the experiment and this is what we get. Okay, now A here, assuming that there are no heat loss in the surrounding and the reaction is complete instantaneously, what is the maximum temperature attainable? So here we need to uh, extrapolate the curve, okay? So to extrapolate it, you need to actually use um, a ruler to help you. If you don't have your ruler, okay, in the exam you will be able to have uh, your ID card, I mean in the real DS exam, so you can use your ID card to help you. Um, so you see the reaction start at here, so we can draw a reference line at the time where the reaction starts. Okay, and then you can extrapolate the curve backwards like this. Okay, and then from there you can extend. Okay, and from my sketching, I was getting like um, 35.8 degrees Celsius. I'm not sure if you get this. Now think about it, if you don't do this step, if you don't do this step, then you are looking at this point being the maximum temperature. And if you sort of look at it, um, actually it tells you that it is only like, um, it is like 35. So if you don't do the rectification, you don't do the uh, extrapolation, then you will register a 35 maximum temperature. If you do the extrapolation, you will have 35.8. So that is quite significant. All right, so here, what is the maximum temperature? This one is 35.8 degrees Celsius. Okay. Explain briefly the purpose of monitoring the temperature of the solution before the reaction start. Now you notice that now the reaction start at the 60th second but before it starts, we keep monitoring the temperature. So what is the purpose of that? Like, what is the purpose of that? Now, this is, of course, to ensure the initial temperature is constant before the experiment. Because you think about it, uh, who knows where you get your sample, okay? Maybe you get your sample from the storeroom, which is much cooler than the lab. Then, of course, it may take some time before it has its temperature equalized it with the room temperature. Uh, so if the temperature of the solution is not equalized at the first place, then uh, obviously it will result in uh, uh, errors, right? So, um, and also, you know, when you carry the solution, you may carry it uh, with your hand and the heat from your palm may be transferred to the solution. So the solution may be hotter than the surrounding. So, Basically, we try to allow time or to make sure the temperature of the solution or the reagent is constant, okay, to ensure the initial temperature of the reagent is constant, okay, this is the key. Now, calculate the amount of heat released in kilojoule hour. So, Q equals to mc delta T, right? The mass would be um, 300 because it is 300 cm cube, so 300 uh, grams of water, 4.18, and delta T. Uh, what is the initial temperature? Let me have a look. Initial temperature, if you kind of looking at the graph, I think the initial is 24 degrees Celsius, right? So here, the delta T would be 35.8 minus 24. 
effect, which is equal to fourteen point eight kilojoule. Okay. Now, part D, calculate the enthalpy change between the reaction zinc and copper 2 sulfate. Now here, first of all, we need to work out which one is the limiting reagent. So we can have number of moles of zinc equal to uh, mass over molar mass, which is equal to 0 0.1. And number of moles of copper 2 sulfate, which is equal to uh, 1.00 multiplied by 300 divided by 1,000. This one is equal to 0 0.3. So um, I think they are all in one-to-one -one ratio. So obviously, zinc is limiting. This one is limiting. Okay. So then we will do delta H equals to Q over N. So Q is negative 14.8 over number of moles 0 0.1. So the answer is negative 148 kilojoule per mole. Okay, that would be the answer. Now, uh, part E, besides heat loss in the surrounding, give two sorts of errors. Um, you have a lot of choices, uh, but some of them you can't. Uh, for example, uh, now you can't say heat loss to the surrounding because by doing the extrapolation, we take in account for the heat loss to the surrounding already. So you can't use that one as the source of error in this case. So maybe you can say incomplete reaction. You can say incomplete reaction or the specific heat capacity of the apparatus are neglected. Okay, these are all acceptable uh, answers. Now, let's move on to the next experiment. All right, for the third classic experiment, we will be looking at the enthalpy change of combustion. Now here, if you look at this setup, now this is not really properly set it up, but you should know how it works. You see, first of all, we have weighted a certain mass of fuel and we set it on fire. As it is burning, the heat released it is used to heat up a beaker of water. And of course, we will know the mass of the water or the volume of the water. And we will measure the temperature change of the water. And here we are assuming that all the heat released it from the combustion of the fuel will be absorbed by the water. Therefore, by measuring the temperature rise of the water, we are able to find out the heat released it, uh, by the combustion of ethanol. And from there, uh, using the quantity of the fuel, we are able to work out the enthalpy change of combustion, just like that. Now here, look at this worked example. One gram of ethanol is burnt, the heat released it absorbed by the water, the delta T is record. So here from 25 degrees Celsius to 55 degrees Celsius. Now, the calculation, heat change EQ equals to MC delta T. Now here we are measuring the heat absorbed by the water, heat absorbed by the water, because the thermometer is stuck into the water. So here, 200 grams multiplied by 4.18, and the temperature change, this one is 25080 joule. Now here, the second one, we assume that all the heat released it from the combustion is absorbed by the water. So the heat released it by the combustion is the same as the heat that is absorbed by the water. Now, the enthalpy change. So you will sub in uh, the heat released it by the combustion at the negative sign because it's obviously exothermic. Uh, and then you divide it by the number of mole. For combustion, uh, the, the number of mole must be considered for uh, the fuel, the fuel that is that, that is burning. So here, one gram is the mass of the ethanol divided by its molar mass. 
and that would be the number of mole and Q divided by the number of mole, you register negative 1,154 kilojoule per mole, right? Now, there are some remarks regarding this experiment. So first of all, the thermometer should not be touching the bottom. And you see here, somehow it is kind of suspending uh, in the water, not touching the bottom. Because, you see, the flame is actually contacting the beaker. So th there is a chance where the beaker gets hotter than the temperature of the water, right? So if you put the thermometer to the, when it, you, when you allow the thermometer bulb to be touching the bottom of the beaker, then the thermometer may be measuring the temperature of the beaker rather than the water. Then you may have an overestimated result, okay? Incomplete combustion may take place because combustion, we said we have two types, right? Uh, if it undergoes incomplete combustion, actually it will release less heat. It all depends on the oxygen availability as well as the fuel itself, whether it is easy to burn completely or not. Okay? Now, even though ethanol is a good fuel, burns very clean, very likely to undergo complete combustion, there is a chance where it burns incompletely. Okay? Now, here, ethanol is volatile. So, uh, if you perform this experiment, one gram of the burning ethanol, who knows, maybe 0 0.1 gram of it has been vaporized it during the transfer of the solution and therefore it will lead to an underestimated result okay now um, there are some other methods to uh, improve this some people when they perform this experiment instead of pouring out the alcohol they will use something called alcohol lamp they will use an alcohol lamp so basically, you can think about it as a, as a container. Like this. So this is a little um, flask that is a flat bottom. And inside we have, an, we have the ethanol. And here we have a wick. So it's like a cotton thread where the ethanol is able to soak up and we actually set it on fire. So this is burning, they are burning the vaporized ethanol and basically it keeps sucking up the ethanol um, to the wick and let it burn. Uh, so if you use an alcohol lamp, we are basically measuring the change in mass of the alcohol lamp. So we want to measure the mass of the whole alcohol lamp before and after the experiment. So the mass difference would be able to tell us the mass of ethanol that is actually reacted. The advantage of this is actually to prevent ethanol from vaporizing uh, to the atmosphere. So this one is better than you actually pour it out to a watch glass. Okay. So that's the idea. Now on the right hand side here, we have something called bomb calorimeter. Now this is a more precise and more sophisticated apparatus to be used to measure the enthalpy change of combustion. We don't have this in our school lab, but we have it in university. Very often we want to uh, study the calories of the food, right? We want to know how much calories is in that potato chips, in that biscuits. So actually, uh, the scientists, they make use of this bomb calorimeter to uh, study the enthalpy change of combustion of that fuel, and therefore able to uh, deduce the calories of which this food item possess. Okay? Um, here, the bomb calorimeter basically is a closed system, closed container. Uh, we will introduce the sample via this pipe and we have an ignition element um, basically generate a small spark to ignite the sample uh, we have obviously an oxygen supply which ensure complete combustion and we have a steel bomb and this is a full metallic uh, container and outside the container we have water of no mass so you can tell as the sample is burning so it releases the heat and the heat will be uh, 
used to heat up the steel bomb and because steel is a very good conductor of heat then uh, quickly the heated steel will be able to uh, conduct the heat to the water and make the hot water uh, hotter so the thermometer you can see is inserted into the water and basically it measures the temperature rise of the water and therefore able to uh, calculate or determine the standard enthalpy change of combustion of the sample okay so this is how it works now down here we have a practice question again pause the video and try it yourself all right so let's have a look first of all we have one gram of pantane burn to heat up 500 cm cube of water uh, the lid here is to prevent evaporation of the water and stir every one minute and uh, before it's 24.8, after it's 72.8. Illustrate the standard enthalpy change of combustion of pantane using a balanced chemical equation. So writing down a thermonuclear reaction, sorry, thermochemical equation for the combustion. So here, C5H12 reacts with O2 to form CO2 and H2O liquid ah, okay so we have five carbon dioxide we have six water and here uh, all together 16 oxygen atom on the right so we have eight oxygen just like that okay calculate the enthalpy change of combustion of pantane so here we will first calculate the Q equals to MC delta T the Q the M here is the mass of the water, so 500, 4.18, and the delta T is obviously 72.8 minus 24.8. Tap your calculator, you will get 100.320 kilojoule, okay? Now, then you will do the delta H, not C, pantane, C12, sorry, C5, H12, C5, H12 equals to Q over N. So here Q is um, negative 100.320 divided by. The number of mole, which is 1.50 divided by the molar mass of pantane, which is um, which is 72, then you are able to get um, okay. So that would be the answer. All right. And then lastly, uh, besides heat loss to the surrounding, two sorts of errors. So you can mention about um, incomplete combustion. Of pantane. You can also mention about um, vaporization of pantane all right so that's the idea now so far from this video and our previous video we have already discussed uh, three very classic examples of calorie metric experiments um, of course you will be able to come across with other um, design or different setup of calorie metric experiments but you know you can see how we deal with this uh, situation um, we are all starting by writing down the chemical equation of the relevant reaction um, looking for the limiting reagent if necessary and then we find out the heat change and then we find out the enthalpy change and very often we have to consider the source of error and the possible improvement now um, before I stop today's video uh, I also want to emphasize one thing it's about the order of magnitude uh, the order of magnitude allows you to 
uh, double check your results. I will, I will put it this way. Uh, what do you mean by the magnitude of the results? Um, if you go back to uh, some of these ex experiments, you see here, this is a neutralization reaction. And first of all, it is an exothermic reaction. So you must make sure that you have a negative delta H. Now, for neutralization reaction, usually we get, you know, the order of magnitude of the enthalpy change would be uh, 10 to the power 1 to 10 to the power 2, right? So here, 40-something, 50-something, 60-something, these are acceptable, okay? This one, neutralization 40-something. Um, here, the reaction between zinc powder hydrochloric acid. For these reactions, you get, again, the order of magnitude of 10 to the power 1 to 10 to the power 2. These are like acceptable um, order of magnitude for these kind of uh, reactions. If you get something like 5,100-something, I'm quite sure this is wrong because you can see reaction between metal and acid should not be that exothermic. If it is that exothermic, the reaction should be very vigorous. Okay. On the other hand, uh, when it comes to combustion, you, you know combustion is a reaction that releases much more heat, right? So for combustion of fuel, uh, we are expecting, first of all, again, negative delta H, and we are expecting to have an enthalpy change that is talking about a few hundreds or a few thousand, something like that. Again, if you get something like a 40 something kilojoule per mole, and I'm pretty sure you make a mistake for an enthalpy change of combustion. So um, this is what I said about the order of magnitude allows you to sort of double check your results. Okay, so uh, that's the end of this video.